Uh, a conversation uh, happened between me and an engineer. I'm an engineer by trade. Um, this person I was talking with, very respected engineer. And we got into this conversation about Jane Goodall, uh, who some of you may or may not know. She's a well-respected scientist who lived with chimpanzees, a very intelligent woman. But her and this very intelligent engineer had something very in common. They believed in Bigfoot. Believe it or not, she actually goes to Bigfoot conventions and actually talks about Sasquatch and other uh, various potential theoretical um, derivatives of the primate family. Very fascinating stuff. I never knew that about her. Uh, but I know that for some, that may be a little bit overreaching and a little bit too far away from what their general belief is whether or not Bigfoot exists or not. Uh, and it got me thinking about uh, how could these really intelligent people come to believe this, something that maybe I don't necessarily believe in. It's almost too far gone. Uh, then I realized that there is a lot that I don't know. Now, I'm not saying that I actually believe in Bigfoot or not, but um, there's many things in our lives which we do not physically know. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's take, for example, um, the knowledge you have now about Bitcoin. Some of you have just heard hearing about it for the first time tonight. Some of you have heard about it a year ago or prior or whatever. Um, how many of you believe you know more about Bitcoin today than you did five months ago? Raise your hands. A significant amount. But five months ago, you probably thought you were pretty knowledgeable from your perspective of conservative economics or wherever you were in, in the place of money, gold, etc. In about six months, how many of you think that you're going to know more than you know today? So by admission, self-admission, there is stuff that you know you don't know. And there's going to be things that are going to surprise you along the way. How does that tie into what other people believe and other philosophies around you? Well, when I'm dealing with um, uh, liberals, I come from a conservative background. I'm more of an in-the-middle libertarian now. I've evolved and I will continue to evolve. Um, I always thought to myself, especially when it comes to a budget or mathematics, it's like they weren't completely logical. But from their perspective, they are. And the reality is, is they're looking at economics, social interactions from a different perspective than you. And I know that my view of it five years ago was different than it is now. And I know it's going to be different from in the future. So I have to come to accept that I may not know all the answers just as much as they don't. So you're equally wrong and equally right. There is no black and white. Everything is a little bit of a shade of everything. Um, so what are some things in the, uh, whether it be the libertarian community or outside, that is just too much for us to swallow? Is, does anybody have any suggestions? Is it just too far gone? Is it? Uh, chemtrails? Uh, chemtrails? Yeah, I know. It's, it goes outside of libertarians. I mean, it crosses all, all borders. There's certain beliefs whether uh, Area 51 has aliens in it or not. I mean, some of it may have some premise in reality, but there's a certain point where you go, that's just too much for me to believe, and that's going too far. Um, but there is, a there is a psychology behind this that some people in government do believe in that you can actually train someone to actually believe into certain far-fetched things as well. I'm not saying that Area 51 or chemtrails is a, you know, fake and they're trying to convince people of it or whatever. Um, uh, but you can actually do this with uh, uh, policy. Suppose you're a large corporation and you need this dam built in this specific area. Over a series of a long period of time, you can slowly introduce them to ideas that appeal to them now. For instance, what if this is a, a, uh, the downsides to this dam prevents the flow of, of um, a salmon going up and down or whatever? There's probably some detriments, but there's also some value as well. Um, what you can do is over the course of time, you can introduce slow things like saying, gee, it would be kind of nice if, if we had electricity up here. It's kind of a remote area. Uh, and immediately, that doesn't change perception, but over time, these little things kind of build up until you have a tipping point. But if you were to come out and you're a big developer in this big remote town, you say, I want to build this dam right now, it may be hard for them to swallow because it's just too far. Uh, there's so much against doing it at that right moment in time. Uh, 
Let's see if I have some of my notes here. Okay. Um, so what are things that we can do to advocate for liberty better? Well, we need to pick and choose our battles. I know that one of the things that deterred me from libertarianism, libertarian party, and some of those things for a very long time, you have to remember, I was a Republican near my whole life, and I started you know, dabbling in these ideas of liberty. It's like, it was kind of interesting, and then all of a sudden I'd flinch back. It's like, that's too, whoa, ew. legalized drugs, oh, well, that's too far for me, <laughs> right? Um, I definitely view it in a different perspective now, and I don't necessarily see that as right or wrong, but I do think that people get so hyper-focused on an, an issue that is addressing their own things. Like, suppose that being arrested for drug use is, a, is, a, is something that's big in your life. That might be a more important issue to you than, say, some grandma with, you know, who's taking care of her grandchildren or something like that. Um, it's all relative. And so in New York, which is where I was living at the time, there were several libertarian candidates running. This was a number of years ago. And they were all running on the pro-legalization of drug, um, drugs. Now, that may be right and it may be wrong. I don't know. I'm kind of uh, you know, agnostic on that issue to some limited extent. But the fact that it, they were making it their issue, it was like, you know, that's kind of you know, unimportant when we've got these local governments, they're spending more than they're taking in. There's all these other issues that are actually need addressing first, reprioritization. Um, and I think that with liberty, if you start making inroads in liberty, all those other things of value philosophically um, will follow. There's almost no going back when it comes to liberty. Once you get your taste of it, then it just propagates. It speaks for itself. It's just much like Bitcoin. Uh, I was very reserved about it. I, I dabbled with it in the early years, years ago when it first came out. Uh, you know, it was hard for me to wrap around my mind around the idea of mining or, or some of these more complex issues. Um, it didn't start to really hit me of what this could do for like poor communities and other liber liberty-minded things like, oh, this frees you up from the state. That wasn't my thinking back then. But then once you start to see it, it speaks for itself. Nobody had to advocate that to me. I eventually came to that realization through actually watching it being used. Um, and that's what liberty will do. You don't have to beat them over the head over a specific issue, issue over luxury legalization uh, or um, um, uh, you know, taking down the man, the state, or whatever. Uh, basically, you need to be talking the things of what you can do to, to help each other. Um, let's see. I have another note here. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the issues that you have encountered? Does anybody have any issues that they've encountered that they've had getting across to people? No, I can know. I've had too many conversations with a coworker, so I don't talk to him too much about anything like this anymore. But the uh, it, we resulted in a final analysis that uh, he believes violence is okay. Mm -hmm. It's required, and it's okay. So, so you're talking about the uh, non-aggression policy, essentially? Yeah. Could could not convince him that violence was uh, something we should be that should be avoided by mm -hmm. governments. He thinks governments should use violence. Okay. So. That was the end of that. I right. Mean, there's no real arguing or but, discussing after that. Right. That's very true uh, to some to some extent. Do you think that he is wrong? Uh, I do. I, I think that uh, I listen to too much Stefan Molyneux probably too, but uh, <laughs> uh, I do think violence is wrong, mm -hmm. except in self-defense. But that's because we all have a right to protect ourselves. Now, why is it that you believe that 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 should be the case? Uh, not, that, that people should exercise the non Is it because of where you grew up or uh, books you've read? Uh, yeah, I, I come from a police family, and I and my my uh, I grew up with my brother, so it makes sense that he became a police officer. <laughs> so maybe that helped me realize that violence is wrong. I don't know. Right now, the thing is, is that a different person may not have experienced the same experiences as you, of you. So they have a philosophy that's completely different, but based on logic that's logical for them, just as much right. as the non-aggression policy is logical for you. 
Um, and I think that people forget that, yeah, they may be right, but you always have to accept that even your own position might be wrong. Um, and I know that's kind of hard to do, uh, but just like I said, like your knowledge now of probably the non-aggression policy is even more refined than it was maybe a few years ago. And it's probably continuing to be refined, so to say that you are completely right about the non-aggression policy would be a fallacy because you know that you don't know everything yet. There is to know about it. Agreed. So when you're in a conversation when they're completely opposition at odds to do, you always have to take a step back and remember, oh, that's right, I'm not an expert in this. Because technically, we're never an expert in any specific thing. No one's perfect. That's just the truth. So it almost comes down to humility. Um, remember that if you take those kinds of positions of absolutes, then it almost becomes a narcissistic position. Even if you are, from the most part, even if the majority believes that you are correct, it's still somewhat narcissistic if you think that. Um, I personally think that you're right, and I also think that from a certain amount, he's right as well from his perspective, but then again, I don't know who he is, and I don't know, maybe if he could be the next Stalin or Hitler, who knows. <laughs> but um, I understand that there's a philosophy, other alternative philosophies to the NIP, and I do know that that's rooted to the individual experiences. Does anybody else have any? Uh... Yeah. Do you have any, um, maybe any approach to deal with, I, I call it the, the the faith in the religion of the state, right? Uh, one of my coworkers as well, smart guy, he's paid to as a strategy consultant for Fortune 500 companies, right? They pay him like tons of money to come in and give his opinion on strategy and whatnot. And we're having this debate at lunch one day and and I mean, he's just, you know, repeating everything, you know, you'd hear on Rush Limbaugh, right? I'm like, stop, Who give me one thing you disagree <laughs> with in the Republican Party platform. One thing, just name me one thing. And he, his big brain goes on, he's like, no, nah, I can't find anything, right? And at that point, I'm like, oh, I mean, there's no critical thinking, right? This is this pure faith in that particular party in this case. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know how to deal with it. I'm like, well, okay, well then, I don't know, we can't talk anymore, <laughs> at least not about politics. Um, well, let's see. Um Dealing with entrenched people is very, is very hard. Um, the thing is, is that we're humans. Um, I don't think that we all should belong to a state, but I do, my personal views is, uh, I'm not an anarchist, but I appreciate the anarchist point of view. Uh, we are collectivists in the, fa in the sense that we're tribal. It's in our nature, just like elephants herd together. Um, you know, not all animals do that. Some are very much, very much uh, independent uh, beings, but we tend to find tribes. Uh, the problem is, is that the way we deal with tribes and the, de the way we have our sh political structures are two vastly different entities. Um, we have very static state. We have Republicans, Democrats, and we have the structure, okay, we have mayors, we have senators, and we have a very big rigid structure. And the problem is, is that you and I change. Our associations that we had in high school are probably not the same associations we have now. We have these groups that we kind of emulgamate to, but then we adapt and change, latch onto this group and this group, maybe there's some overlap or whatever. And maybe that's the way you need to approach it of, rather than it being a binary thing for or against the Republican Party, but you need to ask about what groups within the Republican Party he maybe more, might identify more. Remember, in the Republican Party, you've got log cabin Republicans, you've got uh, all these other subgroups, I just named that one just because it's just one that sticks out. There are many subcategories of Republican, just like there is Libertarians. You have anarchists, you have classical liberals, uh, you have minarchists. Now, some may claim that one is not the true libertarian, just this way some Republicans may say that this is not a true Republican belief. So maybe that's a different way to approach it, is what, kind, what forms of Republicanism appeals to you over one another? Or same thing would apply to the Democrats as well, it works both ways. Um, and you will find that there is no solid definition of being a Democrat or Republican. Uh, just the saying is like, you have an interest in this. Um, there's many things in our lives that are just simply not black and white. Everything is a shade of gray, a little bit in between. Does that help? Yeah, sure. Anybody else have questions? In talking with certain uh, family members who may, be, may or may not be neoconservatives at the moment, mm -hmm. um, I battle with the perception of me being naive. That 
And uh, I looked at the definition of the word naive, and it's specifically that I lack a critical piece of information that if I had that information, I would believe differently. That's the definition of naive. Mm -hmm. And when prompted, these members never actually give me that piece of information that I'm apparently lacking. So that's kind of the struggle I've had in trying to explain and elaborate on some of my beliefs. Oh, well, you're just naive. Are you a believer in Bitcoin? Uh, what do you mean by that? Do, do you think that Bitcoin is a really good technology that will revolutionize things? Uh, I'm uh, reserving judgment on that at right. this point. Right, because there's certain information that you don't know yet. Correct. And the, uh, I'm using that as an example because I was hoping that you were more familiar or completely not familiar with it in either case. Um, there's certain things that you just don't understand yet, and I completely buy that argument, whether it be Marxism. I mean, from my perspective, I think it's completely wrong. But I do also accept there may be some piece of magical information out there that I just simply am not aware at, about. But the problem is, is on the other side of it, they forget that they don't know everything as well either. And so it goes both ways. Uh, how do you approach people like that? It's very difficult to do. Um, let's see, with families, um, uh, well, what you could do is, do you identify, uh, what, was, what was, it was the specific uh, instance again where they... Uh, well, uh, I think probably the main political issue there, roads. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, well, you're just naive. Mm -hmm. Government has to provide roads. So do you, do you self-identify as an anarchist or...? Yes, yes, actually, uh, anarcho-capitalist. Anarcho-capitalist, that's fine, that's fine. Now, do you think that there are uh, other anarcho-capitalists that believe exactly what you believe? Or do you think there's going to be a little bit oh, of differences? I, I very much doubt that anyone believes exactly what I believe. Well, that's true. And, and that's 100% correct. And that goes along with any other philosophy. Um, what I really strongly believe is that you may have a book of philosophy, whether it be on Buddhism or libertarianism or objectivism or whatever. But really, it's in the eye of the beholder. These are only written words. How you perceive them and how you adapt that to your own philosophy in life is really up to the individual. No two philosophies will ever match exactly. So rather than self-identifying and putting yourself in a box for them, placing it on a platter for not necessarily ridicule, but uh, maybe, I don't know, looked upon as an entity that's unsavable or whatever, you may want to start presenting yourself in a, in a way that I'm unique. Uh, maybe point out differences that are different between you and another anarchist. There's plenty to choose from. I mean, you've got plenty of speakers uh, that are here that identify as anarchists or ANCAPs, but have completely different points of view. I know that um, Jeffrey Tucker has a much different view than Amanda Billy Rock on certain issues while they do overlap on others. So find yourself some issues that you do have differently than other anarchists and present that to your parents and say, listen, this is too whack for me. This is, uh, and then they'll start to relate to you in those matters because it may be too whack for them as well to understand or believe. And then you start building common ground rather than just being, okay, us versus them. Because essentially what you're doing is by self self-identifying and putting yourself in that box, you've created the border. And, and as an ANCAP, I, from what I understand, most of them tend to believe with not having borders. So don't make borders for yourself. All right, thanks. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, one specific issue that mm -hmm. uh, I'm continually amazed, uh, the response I get from anybody but libertarians pretty much across the political spectrum from Greens to social conservative Republicans is on the FDA. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll bring up a hypothetical and say that there's this drug that is potentially life-saving. Somebody's about to die in you know, a matter of months if they mm -hmm. don't you know, take this drug or something like it. Mm -hmm. And the drug's already been approved by you know, the European Union, mm -hmm. but the FDA needs another five years of uh, you know, testing. Yeah. testing. Yeah. And Pretty much everybody, everybody I talk to will say, well, that's too bad. The person, you know, too bad for that person. But if they were in this situation or their you know, loved one was in the situation, they wouldn't feel that way. And I just don't understand how I can argue with somebody like that who just believes in the government that much. That they you have blind faith into the government that will, they will take care of you, yeah. Uh, and it's, I, I love FDA questions or, um, or anything to do with GMOs and that kind of stuff. I love those kinds of discussions because I always tend to think there's always a third option that even libertarians, like if you were ask, okay, uh, here's a good one, a good example. Um, uh, GMO uh, is a good example of um, big issue, okay. 
Should uh, Monsanto be mandated to um, uh, label their products? How many of you believe that? Few, minor, minority, but there are a few. Um, how many believe they shouldn't have to mandate, or I mean, uh, shouldn't have to label their products? Okay. Now, the people that believe that they be, should be mandated, at least by community or state entity, they're looking at it from a different perspective than the people that believe that it, they shouldn't have to. The people that believe that they shouldn't be forced to label the product are looking from a, from a free market capitalist situation. Whereas the people that believe that they should be forced to label it, they may identify as libertarians. Heck, they're here. They're probably identifying as libertarians. But what's going on in their mind that could defy this free market capitalism idea? Well, from my own personal thought is that free market capitalism isn't existing when it comes to Monsanto. They've become a monopoly. And as most of you know, monopolies defy free market capitalism. That's not competition. And so how do you compensate with that? I do think that it is a band-aid upon a bigger issue, uh, but I do understand the rationale behind it. Is, is that you know, is a pill to swallow? But now we go into, say, drugs, life-threatening uh, illness, and you need a, um, this drug to be passed uh, through the, the FDA. Um, maybe you do need to per, uh, ask them, uh, have you tried asking what if this was your illness? Would you, would you want it passed through? I mean, is that? Yeah, I have, but it's, until they're actually you know, brought to that point, they're not going to give it up. Yeah, and the other thing is, is that some people will take the defensive position. Once they've taken a specific position, it doesn't have to be this specific issue. It's human nature is that once you've kind of outlined a philosophy, people want to try to defend it and they become more entrenched, more entrenched until there is a fallacy that's simply not logical, but they're trying to just defend themselves even further and further and further. We're all guilty of that. Uh, sometimes you'll look back as like, oh, that conversation I had last week, you know, that was kind of a little bit excessive, but really there is a shade of gray, especially when it comes to drugs and legalization. No two drugs are alike. They all have different side effects. There's different reasons to have it mandated through the FDA, and there's reasons not to. There's all these little sub-things that you wouldn't even think of in the conversation that you're having. Uh, so a way to approach it is have them ask you, uh, why do we have the FDA? Why is it necessary? Uh, maybe become more educated about what caused the FDA to go into, an existen into existence and look at those original reasons. I don't know off the top of my head why the FDA became in existence, but I'm sure Wikipedia has some information on it. And then maybe you want to take a look at would those same reasons that it was created 50 years ago or 60 years ago or whatever still apply today? And now that we know more about liberty and freedom, what would it have been an alternative method to have created that? that entity at the time. So sometimes you have to go out back to the past and history. You have to learn from history in order to go forward. Talking about the here and now may be deadlock, may be a stalemate. So go back to the roots, and then you can address the future. Okay. So as a former Republican, yes. do you have any experience combating the gay marriage issue or, you know, I get, I get, I've actually had some interesting confrontation or, with... Or rather, not confrontation, but a success, actually, changing the, the minds of the, the R's. Uh, you mean uh, changing the minds of libertarians? Uh, or no, Republicans? changing the minds of Republicans or conservatives, that big government, you know, how can you say you're against big government when you want... Exactly, yeah. yeah. I've actually, and what's interesting is I've actually come head to head with believers of state intervention in this issue within the Libertarian Party more than, say, the Republican Party. Um, the, one, the way I, I have my own personal belief on marriage, uh, I do think it's, you know, I have my own experiences, my own unique perspective on it. Uh, I don't believe gay marriage should be legal. Bear with me. I don't believe straight marriage should be legal either because it's none of their business. They, they shouldn't be evolved yay or nay. It's, it's, it's just not relevant. It's not relevant to their function. Has that been successful in yes, changing? Yes, that okay. perspective has been pers uh, successful, especially when I first come out and say, I'm against gay marriage. First, that catches their ear, and perhaps maybe, some, maybe they may identify. Maybe there's some kind of bigoted person that really is against uh, homosexuality or whatever. That catches their attention, and as well as the people that are... 
uh, you know, in favor of same-sex unions, et cetera, marriage, whatever, that catches their ears too because it's, it, to come out and straightly say it like that in that manner is, is kind of a big blow because even Republicans who may be against it sometimes aren't straight like that. So if I say I'm against gay marriage, but I also think uh, you know, gay marriage and straight marriage shouldn't be legal either. And then that also hits them with something they've ever heard of before. Who would be against straight marriage? That's not something that you hear in the, in the normal lexicon of news. Yeah. Well, and, and you're, you're really not against marriage. You're against state licensing and state permission of exactly, marriage. Exactly, exactly. And was, I had this conversation yeah. with Mandrake. I don't know if you, you know yeah. he got married recently. He's against it too. He had to get married for physical reasons. Uh, because he, he, yeah, exactly, exactly. He he he, he, hadn't, he was backed in the corner. There was nothing else he could do. Um, um, basically, his wife was Canadian, and they, she could only be here for so long, so he had to marry her for them to be physically together. Um, but they both are against uh, uh, state marriage uh, as well. So yeah, that's, that's my position. And I actually find that that position is much more welcoming uh, to people who are backed in those corners that say that gay, uh, that gay marriage should be legal or should not be legal. They never thought there was a third, mar a third option that no marriage should be legal. More, or at least, who goes to the government to ask for permission? That doesn't sound like marriage to me. I mean, um, why should I have to ask Governor Cuomo or Barack Obama who's in my bedroom? It's none of their business. So I don't need them to sign off a piece of paper for me for that. Maybe if they send me a fruit basket, I'll invite them to a wedding. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Sure. How do you disabuse people of the notion of the social contract? That is, like, just by maintaining a residence in a certain geographical area, you're agreeing, you're consenting to an entire batch of policies that uh, have just been kind of applied to that area by people in yeah, the past. Yeah, we, we, we don't get to choose where we're born, right? Is that kind of like what you're... Yeah, and, and, and that always comes down to, like, the sticking point when I'm talking to statists. Like, they'll agree with me on most things, but then, like, there's the two issues. Like, taxation is theft, I'll argue, and they'll say, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the social contract. I'll say, I never agreed to this, and they say, you can always leave. And that's, like, the end of the conversation. Well, Go to Somalia. Yeah, right. Yeah. Go to Somalia. Yeah, that was the. In fact, I'd never heard the Somalia argument until I think it was two years ago. It's still noise made. It probably noise the heck out of you guys too. But um, I'm kind of in an interesting position where um, the social contract, because like just like everybody else here, we all have our different views in libertarianism, uh, anarchy, and all that stuff like that. This is one of those issues I'm kind of in between on. Um, but I'll take your position fr from your perspective. Um, uh, let's see. So they're arguing that you should just leave, that you have to accept this, and you're saying that you shouldn't have to accept it. They're right? saying that just by, by staying here, I am accepting it. Now, what you could do is you could say, what if you were born in 1938 Berlin? Ask them what they, what they would feel like then. I mean, maybe, or don't, you know, we kind of don't want to go into the, the whole Nazi Hitler thing and then you devolve the, you know, no, with, with Godwin's for, uh, law. Uh, you could probably do a different situation. You could probably say uh, uh, 36 BC uh, Rome or something like that. You could probably pick something and say, okay, well, you have to then accept the dictatorship of where you're born. Um, so, Rather than making it about what's good about the specific situation, we've inherited America, which may not be the perfect place, but it's not bad. We kind of lucked out and from, from, from their perspective is what they're thinking. And they're thinking, OK, well, just be glad you have what you have. Um, but very easily, they could have been born in a completely different uh, location. So now you need to take it from not about you, but about them in a different location. I have a couple of con um, statements. Uh, one about the social contract. Mm -hmm. the social contract says that um, the citizen will give up certain rights for the protection. Uh, the state will provide protection for their life and liberty. Mm -hmm. uh, the state, since uh, 1871, I think it was, I may be wrong, uh, has the Supreme Court has said the state does not owe you, uh, you, you can't. The state doesn't owe you protection. You can't sue for protection, no obligation. So there is no social contract in, in that regard. You don't have to worry about that. 
Right. Uh, the other thing is uh, marriage, the state requires marriage so that it owns your children. Uh, a lot of people who are married don't realize that they don't own their children. The state does. Uh, if, they, if they're ever drawn into a situation with the state, the state owns your children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why they need the uh, the license. Yeah, there's 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 two interesting um, uh, points the the uh, spin off of that. Uh, I think it's around 1670. A law was written, uh, and it's still in the books. It's still technically a law. If you live in Brunswick, Maine, have you guys ever been in Maine? It's a nice state, similar to New Hampshire. In Brunswick, Maine, it is illegal to go to church without your musket. It's still a law of the state. You can technically be arrested for going to church without your musket. And it actually goes back to, I don't know, which it would be interesting if you don't have a license to carry or whatever. I don't know. I don't, I'm not familiar with the firearm laws, I mean, currently. But I do know that that law is still in the books. And that's left over from when they were getting raided from uh, local tribes, which they probably pissed off for whatever reason. So they mandated that everybody had to protect the community. I just... It's just spinning off of that, which I find fascinating. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Well, what, what, what about the state's involvement in, say, uh, Anabaptist communities, so also known as Mennonites or Amish? Um, none of them register for, uh, for social security car, for social security numbers. Uh, their marriages are pro completely uh, off the grid, essentially. It's all internal matters. They kind of live and coexist. Um, one wonders is how they're doing it, and they're not getting arrested, right? I mean. How do they get by? Well, the simple reality is, is those local communities have come to accept it. The government and tyranny will only go as far as the people allow. And in those communities, there's a lot of Anabaptists. There's also a lot of tourists revolve around those. So even the people that aren't uh, Amish or Mennonites or whatever, they benefit from those communities not being harassed. So essentially, you have whole counties. So essentially, you have communities banding together to protect themselves against the state. And I think that's where liberty will really thrive is in uh, communities. How many people have gone on, you know, had a block party with your neighbor? Raise your hand if you've done that this last year. A few people. If I asked this question 30 years ago, how many of you believe would be raising your hand? All of us, almost essentially all of us. Uh, I've seen that, and it's different with depending where you live. I grew up as a naval brat, so I've seen many different communities and how they've thrived, and I'm starting to see that the way the state is structured is they're kind of isolating you from your own neighbors. I mean, people used to bring soup to somebody who was sick or if they had a newborn kid, they would help. The community, it takes a village to raise a child. It doesn't take the state to, to, to raise the child. It takes your community, which may change from year to year or some people may come and go, that's where it really comes down to. And I think that um, protesting against the state head on with a big sign saying audit the Fed, uh, I think that could be met with resistance and it's not as effective as simply going off and doing your own thing with your own community. A bunch of people may get together and say, oh, we're going to create our own digital currency. Oh, Federal Reserve is now, is now irrelevant. We don't need to audit the Fed anymore. That's what you need to do. You need to decentralize and peer-to-peer -peer all aspects of your life. And when that happens, they can't squish you out. It's like you know, cracks in the dike. They may put one there, but there's another one springs up. So that's what it really takes is, is to get involved with our communities, whether or not they're libertarian or not. It doesn't hurt to bring a batch of cookies to someone who just moved in down the street. It's old school. That's old school libertarianism in practice, becoming a community. And that's you, your relationship with them. That's not about the government's relationship mandating that you must know who your neighbors are. There's relationships that can spawn up from that. You never know what may come from that. Have any, any other questions? Oh, was there, was there a question in there? I know that you made some statements. No, yeah, you saved me. That's all right. Are we doing on time? Another five, ten minutes? All right. Oh, you have a question? Let's say hypothetically your first principles are self-ownership and non-aggression. And the person you're talking to rejects those principles in their entirety. Should you continue talking to them if your first principles diverge right from the get-go? I think that if you stop talking to them, you will be very lonely. And they're very, it, this is, I call the Facebook effect. 
Uh, the way the algorithms work on Facebook is that it aggregates your feeds so that you're talking to people that agree with you and it starts to filter out people over time based upon conversations that disagree with you and I hate that for that very reason because before long you start talking to an echo chamber and then you start being self-contained. Liberty doesn't grow that way. Liberty grows by talking about things that maybe you, that aren't even related to what you're talking about. Um, I mean you may become head to head on this, start talking about something else. Um, I do think that stopping communication is way worse than just changing the subject, even though changing the subject may not be direct and to the point. Um, but I think that in the long run, it'll pay off. If they're exposed to you and your liberty weighs, and if you truly believe in liberty, you don't have to preach it because it'll speak for itself. They will start to see the benefits in your lives and in others or in commerce or in philosophy or in politics. Theoretically, if your philosophy is that good, you don't need to Bible thump for it. It'll just work. So just keep them in your lives and start talking about something else completely else, maybe music or drums or, or, or dancing or whatever, whatever, whatever other subject you may have in common. Are there any other questions? Oh, here. Mm-hmm. So just kind of a, a related thought and be interesting to, to see what you think about this as well. Um, I don't actually try to convince people of anything um, politically anymore. Yeah. I, I find that a much more effective way of getting people to you know, see my perspective is just to learn who they are mm-hmm. and just kind of connect with them on a personal level. Yeah, and, and you may undercover. Not even talk about politics. You may really. undercover. You may uncover things that are in their past or whatever that have put them in those positions where you do disagree with. I agree with that a hundred percent. Which, uh, which is interesting. My wife over there, she comes from a completely different family. I mean, we're talking much liberal family. Would you say? <laughs> we completely diverged on a lot of other issues. So early on, we just stopped talking about the points that we were head on, and we just started talking about other things. And we've both evolved in other positions, probably positions we never even thought were important to us, and they just slowly evolve together. Um, and I just find that the best way is find common ground is good, even if it has nothing to do with the subject at hand. Anything else? I think we're just about done. Oh, no, no. Okay. <laughs>